Keatley, director of the Charles Wood Girls' Choir, and I'm here to see Sarah MacDonald, director of the Girls' Choir here at Ely Cathedral, and composer John Rutter, and we're standing in this stunningly beautiful 14th century Lady Chapel at Ely Cathedral, which has a very, very fine acoustic, which is a very good thing because we're going to talk about singing girls' choirs and we're going to have an opportunity to hear Sarah's young choristers sing and rehearse. John, you are a patron of the Charleswood Festival and you've been to visit the festival a few times. I wonder, um, what are your impressions of the festival so far? Oh, it's my kind of festival. You just want to come back and back and back because you've got gorgeous music in a gorgeous town with not one but two lovely cathedrals. You've got a fabulous programme of events. If you're there in the flesh, you've got good company, good food, good drink. What more can you ask for? And I've got a very personal connection with Armagh and the Charles Wood Festival because, in fact, Charles Wood is my grandfather in music. He taught my high school director of music. And so a lot of Charles Wood's ideas about composition got passed on to me. So that's a very proud connection and of course with the virtual element in the Charles Wood Festival in these last two years you're winning friends from all over the world and that's amazing of course we all want everything to take place in the flesh again but the virtual dimension I think is here to stay and will be an important part in the festival in years to come mm. G.R. Woodward wrote the silliest words you can ever think of until you actually sing them. <laughs> and the thing, he was a musician himself. Mm. And those texts, you know, let steeple bells be swung and, and all that mm. by priest and people sung. <laughs> um, they're actually perfect. They look daft on the page, but they're beautiful to sing. Mm. And so he had a real gift. And Charles Wood music wears extraordinarily well. I mean, it's a conservative craftsmanship but Hail Gladdening Light is timeless. Mm. It, it, yeah, it's as fresh today as when it was written mm. um, 100 years ago. And I think that's rather amazing. Some choral directors place a great importance on the value of vocal warm-ups at the beginning of rehearsals and it was an absolute joy to hear your warm-ups with the choristers in the Lady Chapel this morning. Um, do you agree with that? I do agree with it, especially when you're dealing with uh, young voices and voices that are beginning to go through voice change. Mm. Um, so girls' voices change usually between the ages of about 14 and 16 
and it's particularly important to warm them up when you're rehearsing first thing in the morning, mm. which, as we all know, is, is a, not the most popular time of day with most teenagers. <laughs> um, interestingly, I don't actually warm up my choir at Selwyn because we rehearse at the end of the day, mm. and they are young adults, and I expect them to have done some singing and some warming up before they arrive in time to prepare for even song. Whereas I start every morning with some kind of warm up uh, with with the girls. Do you think your choristers enjoy singing specific periods or styles of music more than others? Or do you think they have a favourite composer? I think the younger ones probably enjoy things with a more obvious tune. It's difficult sometimes to convince them of the merits of early music um, when they haven't got, when they don't rehearse with the adults. Um, so they only hear one, maybe, maybe two parts if it's split. Mm. Um, the older ones uh, certainly start to develop a love for more sophisticated stuff and I think by the time they get to sick form um, they would follow my lead in loving things like howls, at least they'd better. I would say that their favourite piece, if you asked them, with the exception of the ones who are new this year so they haven't sung it, is possibly um, Bless Pair of Sirens. Mm. So, Sarah, you've been director of the Girl Choristers here at Ely Cathedral since 2010, and I'd love to ask you about your thoughts and reflections on the advent of Girl Choristers in our cathedrals during that time. It's been really fantastic to see so many places giving girls the opportunities that boys have had for so many generations. Um, certainly, I'm old enough that even in the enlightened country that I call home, which is Canada, I wasn't allowed to sing in our cathedral choirs. All three of my brothers were, but I was not. It's also been good to see the number of places, especially really recently, partly perhaps uh, encouraged and, and uh, accelerated by COVID, but who have been doing what we've just done at Ely, which is announcing parity mm. for the girl and boy choristers. Um, some places began with parity and set up their girls uh, only when they could have parity with the boys in places like York and Durham and Exeter and Salisbury. Um, but there are others where, including Ely, where the girls sort of fit into the gaps. Um, so we sang on the dumb days, mm. uh, and uh, so as not to interrupt the boys' schedule. But um, I think it shows a uh, real value for what the girls offer to the cathedral liturgy as well as what this education offers to them as, as people and musicians, um, that we've been able to make that change recently. Do you think there is a difference between boys' voices and girls' voices? And how do you see that difference? There isn't a difference pre-voice change, mm. I don't think. They're young trebles. Um, the big difference is that the children's voices change at different times. Mm. Um, so. Basically, they are an unchanged treble voice, uh, or else they are a young soprano or a boy going through voice change. So the thing about boys is that they tend to reach their sort of the, the, the vocal peak or that, that sort of golden point mm -hmm. at probably age 11, 12, 13, mm -hmm. whereas girls reach that stage in their voice age 14, 15. Mm -hmm. And then by the time they're 16, 17, they start to be young sopranos, occasionally young mezzos, and very, very occasionally a young contralto, but that's a, an extremely rare voice part. Um, so 
I think children, when their voices are at roughly the same stages, can sing together really well. But of course, the, the other side of the coin there is that the maturity uh, emotionally and intellectually and physically, uh, separate from their vocal maturity, is very different between a nine-year-old boy and a 14-year-old mm. girl. Mm. And that's where I think people get frightened of putting them together. Mm. Um, and the possibility that boys will leave because uh, the girls obviously can sing later th and through the change a little bit more easily. And do you think there will ever be a time when we see the two groups in a kind of a non-binary way? Well, we need to, don't we? We've got one non-binary member of uh, mm -hmm. the Girl Choristers at Ely, mm -hmm. um, for example, and there are other places where that is the case. And I think, you know, if there's a, a really, you know, sort of serious issue, then there are some places where actually the children are mixed. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, including uh, Tewkesbury Dean Close, which is going mixed next year, Rochester, mm. some of the smaller parish church cathedrals, mm -hmm. um, Carlisle, Manchester, um, Edinburgh, obviously, which has been mixed since 1978. Mm. Um, and so those are options, I think, for people who actually don't want themselves or their children to go into a one or the other. Mm. Um, but obviously, the spectrum you know, there are the edges and then there's the kind of bulk in the middle and then there are the edges. And of course, at the moment, the system is geared towards the bulk in the middle, but society is as well. Mm. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't consider the edges. We do need to consider them. Mm. For some children from quite challenging situations, I think being a chorister is the one kind of stable thing in their in their life, yeah. and it means so much to them, and that, I find that very moving. Yeah, yeah, and well, uh, it's interesting that it's socially a much more diverse group generally around Britain's cathedrals than it ever used to be. Mm. It was thought of as a rather middle class mm. thing. And now it actually is people from very different backgrounds. Mm. But music calls to us all. Mm. Um, if music is there in your heart, um, the love of singing is as natural as wanting to swim. You know. But somebody has to give you the opportunity. Mm. And if your school doesn't have a swimming pool, or there isn't one nearby, you may never discover that you love swimming. Mm. And it's the same with singing that that love is there in most people's hearts, I think, but it never gets a chance to be expressed. And that is something that we're all trying to combat and give every child the opportunity to discover that activity that's as an expression of you. Mm. Um, not just your body, but your soul, your spirit, um, all find an outlet in the singing that you do and when you're singing with others it's multiplied many times over. For me, hearing the girl choristers in action at the start of what's going to be a busy school day is a reminder of what it feels like to be a member of such a fabulous choir in such a gorgeous cathedral. It was an opportunity not available to girls, of course, when I was growing up. I was privileged, I was able to sing all that lovely music and it came flooding back this morning as I heard Elgar, Spirit of the Lord, um, one of my favourite pieces. Oh my goodness me, S.S. Wesley and Thou Wilt Keep Him in Perfect Peace, sung so beautifully by these young girls as if they'd known it all their lives and of course they haven't. Um, they are learning this music fresh for the first time. And although of course it never grows old, it's still evergreen in my heart, it's wonderful to think that these young girls are experiencing it for the first time. And what I wanted to say to them 
at the end of their rehearsal is, you're going to remember this all your life. Being a chorister is such a special experience and I believe there's no such thing as being an ex-chorister, that it leaves its mark on you forever. Whatever you do in life and whatever calling or profession, or wherever you go, that will always be something that is still there in your heart. I don't know of another educational opportunity quite like it.